think we are all set. So, so reminding you that, that this was prepared for this memorial talk, uh, I had this introduction and this introduction was a book that uh, Sri Kumar Banerjee wrote uh, on phase transmissions uh, with a focus in titanium and zirconium. And, uh, and it's a very widely referred book and, and the work that I'm going to describe sort of takes off from this, which is why I chose it for that uh, memorial conference. And, and it deals with something that we material scientists call uh, martensitic transformations. And essentially, these are diffusionless transformations. So, so broadly in material science and all disciplines, you can have two kinds of phase transitions or phase transformations, one of which is diffusion control, the other is uh, without diffusion. And, and the Martensitic transformation is one which we define as being without diffusion and, and essentially controlled by, by what is what used to be commonly referred to as a military movement of atoms from one, the parent structure to the product structure. Okay? And, and uh, <coughs> really there are two pathways through which these Martensitic transformations take place. And, uh, and, and so, in this book, there is a definition of, of uh, Martin Sedgwick transformations which are lattice strain dominated. So, so you are transforming in a, in a, in a invariant way from the parent to the product Martin site to the product. And, and uh, there is something which he calls uh, in Sri Kumar in this book shuffle dominated, which is very often related to ferroelectric, ferromagnetic or omega transformations, again in titanium alloys. And, and when we started studying these transformations, uh, we realized that, that actually in titanium alloys, it's a combination of both of these. And, and, and these set of transformations, these pathways, if you will, can take place simultaneously or sequentially or one after the other. And, and depending upon what happens, you get very unique properties. Okay, so that's what I'm going to describe to you about. Now, typically, a, a, a parent to product martensite looks like this when it's lattice strain dominated. So you get these fairly large plates. Uh, the, this is a transmission electron micrograph, and and within the plates you have uh, something called twins, which which accommodate the strain from the parent lattice. To the product phase. So, this is typically the morphology of a martensite plate that we often see. And as we go along, I'm going to contrast this morphology to, to what we find when we change the pathways to the transmission. So, a phase diagram of titanium looks very simple. So, there's a high temperature BCC phase, which is disordered, uh, a low temperature HCP phase, uh, which is uh, also disordered. And, and if you add uh, atomic elements which stabilize the high temperature BCC phase, then you, then you stabilize that BCC phase down to room temperature. But if you quench from the material from this high temperature phase to the low temperature phase in this, uh, to this single phase or two phase region, and this is the two phase HCP plus BCC region, uh, you get a transformation to martensite. Okay, and, and, and that occurs because uh, thermodynamically, uh, if you cross what is called the T naught point, which is the uh, equi free energy line in this region uh, between the alpha and the beta phases, if you cross that rapidly, you can prevent uh, diffusion and, and transform in a, in a diffusionless way to the product Martin site. So that's the phase diagram we are talking about. Now, a little bit about the microstructure, and, and, and we metallurgists tend to describe things in terms of atoms and projected atom positions and so on. So, this is our hexagonal close packed structure. It has a P63 MMC symmetry for those of you who think in terms of symmetry and the BCC, which is IM3M, 3 m 3 bar m and, and what we are going to do is to look at the projection of these structures. We are look, going to look at the projection down the C axis of this hexagonal phase. And this is what the projection looks like. So, so these B atoms here are at the centroid of these triangles. And bear with me because it has some reflection on, on what I'm going to show you later. And if you project 
the BCC phase down this axis, which is the 110 axis, it looks like this. So, you can see the similarity between the parent phase in this projection and the product phase. So, these angles are a bit different. So, 60 degrees in the product phase goes to 70.5. So, you have to have that distortion in the lattice, which gives rise to the lattice strain. And then these atoms here, the B atoms on the next plane here, have to move a little bit. So, you can see that this one has moved here, this one has moved here, and this one has moved over there. And, and if you then distort this parent phase to this product phase by changing this angle and then move these atoms on every alternate plane by a little bit, a fraction of the interatomic distance, you can, you can get the HCP structure from the BCC structure without any diffusion. Okay? So, that is what we call a martin sidic transformation. Right. So, uh, so, there are different ways of looking at this and I'm, I think I am not going to go through this in too much detail, but again, just to describe this, these atomic movements to you in a, in a slightly different way. So, this is my parent BCC structure and, and this is the shear which changes the angle. Okay? So, I have got the 70.5 degree angle. So, that is the shear which changes the angle and then I put in these atoms on the next layer and move them slightly and I have ended up with the HCP structure. So, I can describe this in terms of two parts. One is the shear, which changes the angle from 70.5 to 60, and the other is what I have called the shuffle, which brought the next layer of atoms into those centroid positions and got me my uh, uh, P63 MMC symmetry. Okay. So, what do we have here? So, this is, this is our, these are our martensite plates and, and many years back and the story starts about something like 1998 when I was at DMRL, we noticed within these martensite plates in transmission electron microscopy, this kind of structure which normally people attribute to ordering in materials and, and normally it is attributed to the formation of what are called anti-phase domain boundaries in ordered materials, which relate small displacements of atoms uh, between different ordered versions of the structure. But here the parent and the product are not ordered. And so, we wondered what this contrast might arise from. And therefore, we came up with the background to that contrast that we saw. So, here is our uh, uh, shuffle going in one direction that I described to you earlier. And in if, if in an adjacent portion of the structure, the shuffle goes in another direction, then you have two domains in which these atoms are displaced in different directions. Note that the basis remains the same of the ACV structure, but in the next layer, atoms have moved from there to there or there to there. These structures are equivalent, but they are related to each other by translational displacement. And it is this translational displacement then that gives rise to this kind of domain structure where within each of these domains defined by these boundaries, you have this fault vector which relates the displacements in the two opposite directions. Okay? So, what we have here is, is a martensite transformation which was first described by Burgers in 1934 and he described these pathways, but this was actually the first evidence that this, this shuffle which is the second part of the transformation actually occurred, uh, real microscopic evidence of that transformation. Right. So, then uh, a little bit of metallurgy and, and it turns out that, that if you add aluminum, oxygen or tin, uh, these elements suppress what is called the martensite start temperature. And this was quite unexpected to us because aluminum, oxygen and tin actually stabilize the HCP phase 
and we wondered why something which stabilized the HCV phase into a phase diagram like this would suppress the MS temperature. Okay, so th this is uh, data that that relates to this, and and so the idea that we came up with is that we now understand that there are these two pathways to the martensitic transformation. One goes does the shear first, that is the long range strain which changes the pair into the product phase and then subsequently this little shuffle which gives you the symmetry that you want. What we postulated was that we can also have an alternative pathway in which the shuffle occurs first and the shear occurs later. Okay? And, and then having postulated that, and I'm not, we melted up a whole series of alloys and I'm not going to describe to you the basis on which we melted up these alloys, but essentially they were alloy compositions that straddled this boundary between the parent phase and the martensitic phase, we, because we wanted to investigate whether the, the shuffle could actually occur first. And indeed, and, and somewhat to a surprise, because, because you, you had this concept but, but when, it, when you actually see it, it's, it's, it's really pleasant. So, so when the shuffle occurs first, instead of getting these large martensite plates, you get this fine distribution of nano domains in the structure. And you can do the high resolution electron microscopy of that. You can see the projected BCC structure over here. And you can see the, what has happened when the shuffle has occurred and these little displacements that have occurred in this projected structure. So, so this is the projected structure. These atoms have been displaced by the shuffle. And you can pick it up by this very beautiful high angle annular dark field microscopy to show that, that these little domains are associated with the shuffle. So indeed, we had a prediction which said that if you add these alloying elements, you should promote the shuffle for reasons that I won't go into now. But then we produced a structure which had only the shuffle and no long range strain. Okay. So here we are then, we, we shuffle first okay. and, and now we have retained the body centered cubic parent lattice. So there is no distortion of the parent lattice, the body centered cubic parent lattice, because we have not introduced the long range strain, but we have only introduced the shuffle. Okay? So the shuffle preserves the BCC lattice framework. So the two microstructures that we get are completely different. If, if the shear occurs first with the long range strain, you get these large martensite plates of the order of well, submicron sized martensitic plates uh, within which you have the shuffle to form the ACV phase. But if you have the shuffle first, then you form these very coherent nano domains within the BCC phase. And, and, and so uh, this gives you an entirely different type of structure. And so the obvious question is what happens when you then continue cooling down? Would you then produce the shear? which leads to the martensite. And so we investigated that next. Okay. And, and, and indeed we found that if you, if you then cool the material down, these little nano domains which just had the shuffle transformed by a local shear to the HCP structure. But look at the difference between the HCP martensite that we now get and the HCP, large HCP plates, the martensite plates that I showed you earlier. The new martensite formed by this pathway consists of extremely fine domains which are related to the original domain size of the shuffled BCC phase. So you produce a martensite by an alternative path and you have completely changed the morphology of the martensite. And this is quite analogous to, to what is known as the glass transition in, in various materials, in, in ferroelectric uh, materials and so on. So here is an, what happens when you cool down or when you load the structure. These are equivalent 
uh, by stress. These are equivalent in a Martin-Sidgwick transition, transition, apply stress or, or cool it down. And you have this gradual increase in lattice strain in these nano domains uh, which, which uh, with cooling. And, and note that I say a gradual increase in lattice strain as opposed to the, to the sort of uh, uh, uncontrolled strain birth, uh, strain that occurs when the mark shear occurs first. I, I hope I am making sense. So, so these are the domains of martensite that you get when you apply stress to the material. Okay. Uh, so the, the analogy to strain glass, and, and so you have these uh, uh, different kinds of materials that are that are examples of strain glass, and this kind of transformation is exactly analogous to that. And, and again, a repetition that the, the long grain strain produces martensite, and, and this transformation pathway produces a nano martensite. And, 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 and I'm going to finish up with just a couple of slides now to relate the very unique properties that emerge out of this, this, uh, this completely different pathway to the martin Sidic transformation. So, so some time back, there was a report in science of a material that was called gum metal. Okay? And it had this very unique set of properties. First of all, you had this effect where the Young's modulus didn't change with temperature. Amazing. You then had a coefficient of linear expansion, which did not change much with temperature. So both the invar and the L invar effects. And you had a nonlinear elasticity. Okay. And it turns out when we analyze this, this material that, that these properties arose directly from the nature of the continuous transformation to martensite by this alternative pathway that I talked about. So these are again properties that we that we found uh, of these materials: the nonlinear el elasticity, the the the, the uh, temperature invariance of coefficient, the thermal expansion, and Young's modulus. And and really, with this suggestion, there are, there is a huge variety of compositions that you can tune the pathway to titanium martensite uh, to get these sort of very unique LN, LN bar and in VAR properties. What is the broad application of all of this? The application is primarily in, in biomaterials where high strength combined with modulus mismatch with bone as well as the lack of toxicity in the human body, all of which titanium is good for. But when you, when you, when you appropriately alloy it and, and tune the martin Sidic transformation, you can realize this modulus mismatch or match with bone so as to avoid what is called the stress shielding effect when you place uh, stress on your implant, for example. And, and so these are the kind of shapes and sizes that can be made out of this kind of material with the appropriate controlled phase transformation. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. I've heard from my physics colleagues. Right. They tried very hard to understand it in terms of network of twins and martensites. sites. Yeah, yeah. And do we really understand shape memory alloy now? I think pretty much so. I uh, but so, so I want to distinguish between the shape memory effect and what we see here. Uh, the shape memory effect is, is essentially an effect in which the long range strain that I described occurs first. But the important part of the shape memory effect is that if you release the stress, uh, the long grain strain simply reverts back. And so it remembers its original shape. That is called pseudo elasticity. Uh, the shape memory effect is slightly different, where the long grain strain leads to a stable martensite on the application of stress. But when you heat it up into the parent phase stable situation, again the martensite reverts back. And because it reverts back without any diffusion, you restore the original parent phase structure and shape. Okay. Sadiq? So it's this reversibility that drives the shape yeah, memory. Yeah. It's a little more complicated than that because not all materials which show martensite show the shape memory effect. So it's a little more complicated than that because 
when the parent phase forms, it has to revert back exactly along the same path that the Martin site formed. It's only then you revert back to the original shape. I just want to know what is the relationship between the gum metal that you showed um, at the very end and the martensitic uh, thing. I missed that connection yeah, actually. So, so the idea was that if you if you control the alloying elements appropriately, you can change the pathway to titanium martensite. So if you have the path in which the the shuffle occurs first, okay. Then the martensite that forms on subsequent stressing on cooling is composed of nano coherent domains in which the strain increases gradually as a function of cooling or stress. This is what gives rise to the gum metal behavior. And this is distinct from the shape memory effect in which the long range strain occurs first and you get these very large bursts of martensite. Okay. So the gum metal has this peculiar transition path from the parent to the product. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So just to make one quick comment about yeah. Baskaran's question. So shuffle is basically the zone boundary phonon. And strain is right. of course in, the combination in, in, of Umesh and I strain. have talked a lot about yeah. this. So he will describe to you in physics. The primary terms, order <laughs> and titanium in BCC phase is unstable with respect to both the phonon and the shear deformation. So the, there's a competition between the two, which one will be driving the phase transformation. and Dipankar's work beautifully shows that shuffle is the can be a leader. Yeah, you can adjust game. which yes, occurs first right. by changing the stability. If you go by physics theory, even in pure titanium, we find that shuffle is the winner actually. Okay. But that's partly due to the errors. And shape memory alloy also, I'll be happy to talk to you about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, please join me in thanking Dipankar once again for <laughs> and doing a wonderful job.